I'm Nurse Murphy. Join me in tackling the National Licensing RN Exam preparation. Today we'll be doing bow tie as a new test item. We'll be using a structure of value. We'll tackle the case studies, bow ties, new items, multiple choice, multiple select, select all that apply. Uh, guided by the NCSBN's clinical judgment measurement model. In case studies, there are six questions. You must answer each question before advancing to the next question. And backtracking is not allowed. However, in the bow tie, you'll actually be using the first skills to actually get to answer the question. So let's go through what these skills are. We'll be recognizing cues within the clinical presentation and within any chart tabs that are provided. We'll be analyzing those cues. We'll be then developing um, what could be going on with this patient as prioritizing hypothesis. We'll generate solutions. We'll take actions and we'll evaluate outcomes. So I can make this more clear by going through the clinical judgment measurement model steps within a bow tie question. So the bow tie uses three steps of the model, but ultimately if we start the model each and every time at the beginning to recognize cues, it all works together to show you as the test taker as having clinical judgment. So let's see, our example here, the bow tie center knot where it says condition, that will be reflective of your advancement of understanding the information that was provided to prioritize a hypothesis of the likely condition your client is experiencing in that specific test question. The left wing of the bow tie is where you'll take actions. Those actions are actually linked to the hypothesis you selected in that for the center condition, the center knot. And you see here, they say to take two actions. You'll have a list of actions and you'll need to prioritize uh, those actions. And then we have the right wing of the bow tie where you'll do your evaluations, the parameter one to follow and the parameter two to follow. So if action one was actually just, let's just do something simple. Um, let's say we want to start um, a pot of water on the stove. So our condition would be uh, a pot of water. Action number one would be to fill the pot with water. Action two would be to turn on the heat source. And then the parameters to follow. Well, first I need to make sure I have the heat at the right setting and I'm going to continue to monitor for what the water to boil. That one just popped into my head. We'll do this multiple times and that will help to make this sort of uh, clinical judgment, which is really following the steps of the nursing process, uh, more clear. The test question screen will have a drag and drop at the top of the shape, at the top shaped as this bow tie, um, and a table of answer options will be posted just below it that you'll drag and drop into the right spaces. So when we interpret this measurement model, it helps us to um, address the test question and rationalize, use our own clinical judgment to select the right answer options. So we, like I said, we'll start with recognizing cues as the first step of the clinical judgment measurement model. And here we have a client that might be familiar to some of you who did the case study with me. So the nurse cares for a 71 year old retired fireman admitted to the acute care unit for COPD exacerbation with no allergies. In nurse's notes at 1300 hours, the client was admitted for telemetry monitoring and treatment for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. And he is here for a COPD exacerbation. Prior admission with a similar exacerbation episode was five months ago. He's maintained on 1.5 liters of home oxygen by a nasal cannula. The client reports three days of increases in this uh, cough, increases in a productive thick tan sputum, increases in exertional dyspnea, just walking to the bathroom really gets him short of breath, and difficulty sleeping despite 
high Fowler's position using three pillows. In assessment, the nurse collects some vital signs. The temperature is 99.7, somewhat elevated. Heart rate 86, we're okay with that. Respiratory rate of 22, 10 to 20 is our normal range, so a little elevated. And blood pressure 167 over 86. And we're always looking at a systolic greater than 140 as a little on the high side. Well, the pulse oximeter reads 90% on 1.5 liters nasal cannula. And we're not sure where the providers want to keep this particular patient. So we're, we're going to put a pin in it, but we're going to highlight it in yellow to clarify where they want that. Um, on the pain scale, the patient's pain is 2 to 3 out of 10, and the patient is pointing to his left lateral chest wall. Well, while transferring the patient from the wheelchair to the bed, the client, you could hear audible wheezes. No one needed a stethoscope to hear those wheezes. And there was exertional dyspnea. You were a bit worried. Let me get him out of this chair and into the bed so he can catch his breath. After he caught his breath on auscultation, the nurse was able to hear at the right middle lobe and the right lower lobe that there were wheezes and crackles. No use of accessory muscles. So this is the information that the nurse candidate taking the test is provided before the test question. So what we do with that information that's provided is we recognize cues and then analyze cues. And here I'm just going to give you an example of my thought process, my own clinical judgment as I tease out the information there. So similar episode, exacerbation of COPD three months ago. So that client likely recognizes worsening symptoms reflecting decompensation of chronic disease. You know, I don't know whether he waits on it for a day or two, but this has happened to him before, and he knows that he's sick. Home oxygen, supplemental oxygen, chronically worn, if they're wearing oxygen every day of their life, that reflects that there's a severe pulmonary disease. Three days of increasing cough and productive thick tan sputum. Well, when I think of this patient having a lot of this thick mucus in their lungs, the duration of the decompensating episode with mucus is overwhelming that alveoli for a few days. So when we have thick tan sputum, uh, we know that the alveoli, that's supposed to be exchanging carbon dioxide with oxygen. And if they're filled with mucus, we're not ventilating very well. Well, we have our vital signs all here, and I, I decided to include pain as the fifth vital sign in this one box. So we look at them as a general, and we see, as I mentioned earlier, a little elevated in temperature, a little elevated respiratory rate, blood pressure is a little elevated, pulse ox at 90%. Of course, with you and I, 90% would be quite concerning, but we want to make sure we find from the provider where they want this patient to be on oxygen saturation. And then the pain scale of two to three at the right lateral chest wall, these slight elevations, um, like I said, is it okay it, within normal ranges for this particular patient? We're going to share this with our provider, but the pain location guides the nurse to the site where to auscultate more closely. And there we have it in our last uh, cue, our recognized cue, the right middle lobe and the right lower lobe have wheezes and crackles. So this accumulation of mucus seems to be localized to those two lobes, the lobes that are most likely impacted with this COPD exacerbation. Exacerbation of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, can come in the form of uh, inflammation, infection. So let's continue. All right, so we see we have even more orders. Just picture this as a third tab that you clicked on and it was of the patient orders. So medication, the patient's gonna go on a, a respiratory fluoroquinolone, levofloxacin as an IV infusion, potassium chloride tablets, methylprednisolone um, IV push, and albuterol nebulizer. The patient's nursing orders, the provider orders the, for nursing service to put to adhere to a 2,500 kilocalorie diet. And why would someone be on such a high calorie diet? Oh, I'm thinking if that's a cue, that's the diet. Well, I'm going to analyze. Oh, that's right. They burn up. COPDers can burn up a lot of calories just to breathe. 
so that's why it increases in the kilocalorie diet. Oxygen, one to three liters by a nasal cannula. So right now, his baseline, his normal home when he's not in any increased illness is 1.5 liters. So we'll, we have room to increase if we need. But you see that there's a ceiling on that. We can't go higher than three liters. Now we have a titration guide or a parameter, and that is to keep the pulse oximeter greater than 90%, not the same of, but greater than 90%. So now I have my answer. I cannot leave it at 90%. I need to go higher than 90% pulse oximetry and less than 96%. And that's because um, these patients are hypoxic drived. So for you and I, what makes us take a deep breath is it increasing levels of carbon dioxide. What makes someone who is a COPD, CO2 retainer, actually want to take a breath is a little hypoxia. So if you take away, you give them too much oxygen, ultimately, the bottom line is they don't might not have the drive to take another breath. So that's why we don't want them at 100%. So keep pulse oximeter greater than 90, but less than 96. So that would be 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. All right, and then keep the head of the bed greater than 45 degrees. So when a patient is seated uh, in high fowlers, their, rest, their diaphragm drops and their real estate of their lung fields increases. All right, so that's the information we have. Um, that left panel provides this client information. And the next slide will present the bow tie destination graphic, very much like the one you see right here, to place the drag and drop responses. A table of answer options is positioned when you take the national exam below the bow tie, so all on the screen. Again, their software has, software has interactive graphics in a way that I don't have access to. Um, you'll select the correct, correct answers from the, from the labeled categories um, and drag and drop in your answers inside the bow tie. The test question writers use this uh, NCSBN's clinical judgment measurement model. So that's why I'm making you go through, and I'm not making you, but that's why I'm making my own self go through uh, recognize cues and analyze cues uh, to guide the answer options for each section of the bow tie. Okay, so let's look at, uh, we have complete the diagram by dragging from the table choices to specify what condition the client is most likely experiencing, which is the knot of the um, bow tie, the center condition client most likely experiencing. And then you're gonna select two actions the nurse should take to address that condition from the actions to take column. And then two parameters the nurse should continue to monitor to assess the client's progress. And you see how I put in here during the shift. This is my clinical uh, reasoning is that, okay, if I'm gonna uh, monitor a parameter, I'm gonna to continue to do that throughout my shift. Okay, so let's look at our table, which like I said, in real NCLEX testing, when you take one of those, when you buy one of those practice QBank services, everything will be formatted just the way you love it. But here are potential conditions, the center one. Is this patient suffering or have the potential um, condition of hyperglycemia? There is no mention of blood glucose. Pneumonia, well, quite possible, it's a respiratory issue. Peritonitis, no, there's no problem with his gut. Uh, fluid volume overload, um, you know, we didn't notice that on physical assessment and they didn't mention it in the provided information. Remember, they only have small screens, limited, just take the snapshot of information they give you, don't expand on it. Okay, so I'm going to, for me, I'm going to say pneumonia. Put that to the very middle because of that right middle lobe and right lower lobe uh, wheezes and crackles. Now, now that we have pneumonia as the condition client most likely experiencing, we're going to take actions that are associated with pneumonia. So in our take actions column, sometimes I feel like this is a grammar test because it says daily vital signs. And you know, when you have a sick patient, we're taking those vital signs at least every four hours. Um, yeah, I guess some places they would take it once every eight hours. So um, daily vital signs is not correct. Titrate oxygen within parameters. Now you may remember, I like that one so far because I see that um, 
um, the oxygen was to be greater than 90 and less than 96. So 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. So I like that answer. I'm going to hold on, putting a little mark to myself on that. Ambulate TID. Well, I'm not walking this man. He had so much trouble just getting from the wheelchair to the bed that I'm, I'm not ambulating him right now. Let's get him stable first. The teach the technique for incentive spirometry. Well, you know, pulmonary uh, exercises are a are you know something that we admire we definitely do that in our post-operative patients without lung disease um but is today the day to, to exercise his lungs i'm not sure there is so i'm going to hold on that for a second and then here keep head of bed greater than 45 degrees i like that answer i'm going to take that action answer because that action because i want him to drop his diaphragm a little increase that real estate of his lung fields so my two actions i want to take are take titrate o2 with within parameters and keep head of bed greater than 45 degrees bring those drag and drop over and then the parameters to monitor as i'm worrying about this respiratory status i want to keep him as stable as possible so the parameter of pulse oximeter i always say how much does it cost to take a pulse ox on a patient well you know it's it's always available um oftentimes there's one right at the bedside right on a bedside wall mounted uh set of um you know vital signs equipment so let's keep that pulse ox on the patient and we can monitor because especially since we want to titrate we want to get them a higher than 90 percent and we want to make sure we don't give them too much we want to keep him less than 96 percent so i like that answer urine culture and sensitivity the lab you know when we really worried does this client have a uti we would that's a priority but we're not really worried about that right now incentive spirometer pretty much like what i said in that actions to take um is today the day to exercise his lungs and then respiratory rate oh absolutely here he was 22. i never did see that they counted his respiratory rate when he was trying to get from the wheelchair to the bed when they were talking about the exertional dyspnea i'm sure it was higher than 22. and so i kind of like that answer too i want to monitor respiratory rate and pulse oximeter and then last we have theophylline serum level theophylline is a medication that it was um very commonly infused on COPD exacerbation clients back in the 80s and some in the early 90s. Uh, it still exists, and that's because it will relax the diaphragm to some extent. And again, if you can drop the diaphragm on them some, we can increase um, lung um, ventilation, if you will. But I didn't see theophylline even listed on this particular client's uh, medication list so I wouldn't select that either so let's go to the next slide okay so we have stars or um, asterisks next to the correct answers so our potential condition pneumonia you get that mucus sitting in in the lung fields where they, it doesn't move and you get increasing um, mucus production that's not expectorated and just sits and clogs those alveoli, you give it enough time, uh, bacteria can come in and cause infection. So pneumonia is condition client most likely experiencing. And then we're going to titrate that oxygen within parameters. So he's at 1.5 right now. I'd probably go up to two. In our uh, COPD, as I always like to go half a liter each time, but continuing to monitor with this lovely pulse oximeter that's on the patient and monitor that respiratory rate. And like I say, the first thing I'm going to do to optimize this patient's lung is to do that non, um, non-invasive uh, action of keeping the head of the bed greater than 45 degrees. So more about the bow tie standalone items. Let's see, we pre it's presented as a single question. Recognize the focus on the specific cognitive levels of the um, clinical judgment measurement model. You know, it starts off with that condition, but you are nowhere ready to identify the condition until you go through the steps of to recognize some cues and spend a few moments analyzing those cues and then coming up with like your nursing diagnosis and then say okay this is the condition that most likely is impacting this patient 
first access the available tabs, making sure you don't miss those posted cues, don't miss the opportunity to analyze the cues that are provided in nurses' notes, um, uh, laboratory, uh, medications, orders, that sort of thing. At the right side of the screen, you'll want to read the test question and identify the stem within the text because it might be asking something that you, know, you maybe you just want to like just say, oh, he's got pneumonia and this is what you do. But you'll want to see is, are they asking what you thought they were asking? So don't guess, read the stem within the text to say, oh, okay, this is a little less complicated than I thought that they were going to ask. So that's another part of this um, model is it's trying to slow you down to spend a moment to not jump to conclusions, but to go through the scientific process of clinical judgment. Okay, identify priorities and stem of questions allow the candidate to develop the priority hypothesis to place in the center of the bow tie. That's what I was trying to say. I should have just read the slide, right? Nursing process, the nursing diagnosis. All right, so spend a moment to identify the category to the left of the bow tie center. From what I've read, it's those actions to take. But, you know, really, this could be adjusted a little, but the actions to take confirm the listed responses that you have actually connect to this response you placed in the center as your answer. So for our patient with um, uh, the condition most likely to be pneumonia, we would want to definitely look at um, keeping the head of their bed up to optimize their, um, their lung function. And we would definitely want to um, keep their pulse ox within those parameters. All right, so spend a moment. Um, I'm just trying to think about what else it is I can tell you. And what I would love to, at this stop, I would love to stop and have you ask me questions. But unfortunately, the format doesn't call for that. All right, so after we have that, we need to evaluate those outcomes. So at the right of the bow tie, the right of the knot, the right wing, if you will, Answer options should align with the other two sections um, as your evaluations or outcomes. So ultimately, your bow tie reflects a visual care plan. Don't forget that right wing of the bow tie is evaluating effect. So anything we did, did it work? If we give them some oxygen, did it go up or down? That sort of thing. Okay, so that drag and drop is essentially what goes on in a bow tie at that left. Select the, you know, I'm here, I'm, I don't know why I'm saying it left. Really what you want to do is you want to um, select the condition that most likely is impacting your client, which is the nursing diagnosis, put it as the not, and then select actions the nurse takes to address the condition. Then select the parameters the nurse monitors to assess the client's progress. You know, um, you definitely want to make sure your patient stays within the parameters of um, pulse ox that is greater than 90 and less than 96. And if you cannot keep him greater than 90, even when you get up to your three liters, you really want to contact your provider. You want to, if you have a problem like that, you want to share it with your team because um, he may need a higher level of care. So complete the bow tie diagram by dragging those choices, I think you get it now, within each column to specify the condition the client is most likely experiencing at that center knot. So the scoring on a bow tie is identified as zero or one. One point for each correct answer, all the way up to five points, and zero for incorrect. So in the condition in the center, we said pneumonia, we got one point. On the actions at left, you know, those would be supporting actions for a patient with pneumonia, two points. And parameters at the right of what we're going to continue to monitor, two there, one plus two plus two equals five total points. Great, so bow tie summary. Here's what we've learned. The bow tie is a standalone test question. It consists of clinical information and chart information that may include several tabs. The, uh, the NCSBN's clinical judgment measurement model has six steps and all of the test writers are keeping these six steps in front of them as they are designing their questions to make sure that um, we're all on the same page. We need to first recognize cues. Don't skip. <clears throat> you want to analyze those cues. What does it mean um, when you identify that the patient has increasing thick tan sputum for three days? 
that he's had a COPD exacerbation just a few months ago. Um, we want to prioritize the hypothesis, take action, and evaluate outcomes. So in the bow tie problem we completed, that center knot was labeled condition most likely experiencing. In my opinion, the request aligns with our prioritized hypothesis of this clinical judgment measurement model, akin to the nursing diagnosis of the nursing process. In this bow tie problem, the left wing was labeled action to take, aligns with take action um, in the clinical judgment measurement model, and it's akin to our implementation phase of the nursing process. And in this bow tie problem, the right wing was labeled parameter to monitor, aligns with evaluate outcomes akin to evaluation in the nursing process. Bow tie scoring, you receive zero when it's incorrect, one point when correct, no deductions, meaning that you would not come out of this question like with a minus one for incorrect answers. You can place and replace so you can keep moving around as you're trying to rationalize, analyze, and um, until you finish the question. Okay, well, that's what I have for today. I plan to build more test, uh, test examples, but I need you to subscribe and press like to help build the channel. All right, take care. Bye-bye.